So um, hello everyone, my name is Etienne Enang and we're having our first of four vlog series where I'm going to be interviewing four amazing um, ladies in academia who have published groundbreaking work within the field of strategist practice research. So today I have with me Professor Julia Balogu and we're going to be talking about her paper that she published in Journal of Management Studies in 2003. The paper is titled Three Responses to the Methodological Challenges of Studying Strategizing and she co-authored this paper with Anne Hoff and Phil Johnson. So thank you so much for being here today, uh, Professor Balogu. So um, this is a landmark paper, obviously, because it is Strategist Practices' first methods paper. And what's really amazing for me is that it definitely breaks, um, offers insights about breaking apart from more traditional approaches to studying strategizing. And so when I read the paper, a recurring question that kept coming to my mind was, how do innovative ideas such as this emerge? How does one get inspired to break apart from the more familiar in order to do something new, something novel? Well, thank you. Thank you, Etienne. It's, it's lovely to be here. And um, thank you for describing the paper as land breaking. I don't suppose when we were writing it, we considered it to be that way. And of course, 2003 is many years ago now. And um, of course, it was written in 2002, published in 2003. And strategy as practice wasn't even called strategy as practice in those days. So we were still we were still arguing about what we should call ourselves as a group, in fact. So of course, the special issue was written was an activity space view. And I think that's quite important to thinking about the background of the piece and what you said is, you know, is innovative in it, in the sense that um, the criticism, of course, of the, the introduction to the special issue, the JMS special issue, was that although we'd done an awful lot of work in strategy and strategic change, we hadn't really got inside the black box to understand the work that people were doing when they strategized or they led strategic change. And that's what I set out to do very much with my PhD. Um, but you said, where do innovative ideas come from? I suppose, so, so maybe I should just say, so first of all, of course, very much when I was starting my PhD, I think it's fair to say not much was written on qualitative methods. What was written about was this is how you do a case study. This is how you do ethnography. Um, we had uh, a lot, and what was written was often about how you analyze qualitative data rather than how you collect it. Yeah. So, um, so what so what was different about this piece i suppose was for a start it was talking about how you collect data um but you also said something about how do you have innovative ideas and i suppose innovative ideas are often forced so the ideas came from this paper that i did a part-time phd it's quite unusual to do a part-time phd whilst lecturing these days but that's what i did and i was trying to collect data from an organization that i was remote from um, and I wanted to collect across what were effectively three divisions and a large number of people. So the task that faced me, and of course, with, I was collecting the data in the 1990s. We didn't have any of the technology we have now. So the task that faced me was, well, well, how do I collect this data on a frequent basis from a large number of people when I can't be there to interview everybody every two weeks? And potentially they didn't want me there interviewing every two weeks. And that's where the idea came from for the use of diaries. And also, as uh, I developed a relationship with participants, the idea for the use of focus groups uh, was it was what enabled me to do collect data on my PhD on a part time basis across a period of 18 months, tracking in quite close detail how middle managers and the change managers were managing dealing with this process and change. So the innovation was really born out of necessity. Um, and then, of course, that came into the paper where we talk about um, interact discussion groups, uh, self-report, or um, practitioner research. So really, that's the background to the paper, I suppose. It was, um, it was luck. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I think you're trying to be modest here, saying that it was luck, but yeah, I will just um, push that a bit further. Thinking about, because you mentioned that you started working on the paper somewhere around the early 2000s or yeah. late 90s. At that time, um, and towards the early 2000s, that's when strategist practice was just emerging as a field. 
Can you share what the methodological landscape was like at that time? Yeah, I mean, I touched on it. Maybe just said a little bit more about that. I mean, it was largely, yeah. it was a large about case studies. If you ask me what the nature of my research was, I would say case studies. Mm -hmm. I guess the textbook everybody, virtually everybody used was um, Yin. Mm -hmm. uh, there were the articles written by, a couple of articles written by Kathy Eisenhart. Um, there were the books by Miles and Huberman where they talked about analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some classic papers um, written really from an ethnographic perspective. But that was really the methodological landscape. Um, it was, it was, I guess, quite narrow. Um, and if you looked into, sort of delved into it and said, okay, well, if I'm doing a case study, how do I collect data? It was usually observation or interviews. And um, that's what, what was considered standard. Um, so, so yes, um, I, the, the, the diary idea came from an individual who had, um, one individual who'd written on the topic with a colleague, um, just quite a small study using diaries. Um, focus groups, I, I can't even really remember where the focus groups came from, potentially some of my marketing colleagues, but again, that was a quite an unusual approach to use, and you will still get pushed on the focus group. Um, so certainly, um, diary mechanisms, focus groups, I, I basically had to make it up because there wasn't material I could read that would advise how I could do this. That's really fascinating. And something that's coming to my mind now is how did you find, so the, the ladies that you co-authored the paper with, were they also like early career researchers just starting their, finishing their PhD or how did you guys well, decide uh, to... Phil oh, Johnson was doing her PhD the same time as me. It's that Phil Johnson and I actually did our viva the same day. My wow. viva was the morning, hers was the afternoon. Uh, using very different techniques, but very familiar with the types of um, approaches that enabled you to get close to people. So the paper message men mentions card sort techniques, which was uh, an approach that Phil used. But then we wrote with Anne Huff, who of course was a very experienced scholar. Um, um, did not work in cognition, for example, so also used to methods that uh, I suppose worked with people to try and get close to them. But again, a lot of those methods were quite new methods at the time. Um, so, so it was, um, I suppose, Phil and I developed it with, with guidance from Anne. And I suppose like any junior scholars, scholars working with a more senior scholar who understands the name of the game when it comes to publishing is, is, is highly valuable. I, I, I don't think would have made the paper or succeeded with the paper without Anne. So um, Anne's contribution is absolutely vital. <laughs> okay. So one thing I've found is when people read um, different articles that groundbreaking such as this, they have different takeaways from them. But I'm wondering for you, what's really the most unique point about this piece what exactly what's your how can you reflect on your key on the key messages that you've passed across in this piece well I suppose was to be innovative and inventive but I mean I think I would also say if you look back at the paper of course technology has moved on so you wouldn't dream of asking anybody to do a written diary these days you say oh you say oh use your mobile phone and record me a message you know um or um uh you know uh, do a video yourself sitting in front of your webcam on a computer as we're doing now um all of which are arguably far easier than getting someone to sit down and handwrite something or type something because they're more immediately accessible um, but also, I, I don't know, I mean, I actually suspect, though, reflecting back on it, that people might consider doing something written and sending it off more secure than doing something on their phone and emailing it to someone. Um, that, so, um, I, for me, that the, the key message was, I, I suppose, really, although the paper wasn't written that way, was, uh, and then that would still be like around today, would be, look at what you've got to do and devise a methodology that lets you get the data you want from the circumstances you're working in. And don't be too hamstrung um, by what would be seen as, as maybe um, more conventional techniques. Because what matters always is you can justify what you've done and you can show the quality of data it has led to and show an analytical path through that data from the phenomenon you're investigating to the contribution you're claiming. Um, so, I would still get pushed back sometimes on focus groups. Well, you know, doesn't that cause groupthink or something like that? To which my answer is, it's, well, it's about the way you compose the focus groups and who you put in them. Um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the key message for me is um, be inventive, particularly given the new technologies. 
Mm. Okay, that's that's good. So another thing is thinking about, we've talked about your reflection on your key messages in the paper and I'm thinking and you've you said you've touched a bit about the future and where we're at now in terms of technology and all that and we, we've also addressed the fact that this paper was published 17 years ago and I'm wondering since you're a sage I would say you're a sage when it comes to strategist practice research what critical insights do you have for um, scholars who are looking to use strategist practice as a tool for conducting research? Well, um, <laughs> what critical insights do I have? Um, I I'm going to pause a little bit because uh, I think anyone that's worked in the strategist practice field, um, particularly using techniques where they want to get close to the practices of individuals, which typically means it's, it's you know, in-depth quality studies, it's getting, it's getting access. Um, and I, I'm not sure that's got easier. I mean, actually, as much as I said about technology may, enabling people to maybe keep diaries more easily than they could when I was collecting my data, uh, people these days are more time pressed. So yeah. why would someone spend a year keeping a diary for you every two weeks? Um, so I think the challenge is um, doing investigating uh, phenomena that are truly topical, that organizations are interesting to have you inside investigating so that you can provide them with some insight because that's how they will give you a commitment that you can collect your data. Um, you know, you would you always get pushback if you say that, well, um, you know, I was doing something that was useful to, to the organization. I gave them some form of feedback. They'll say, well, were you polluting your context? But there's different ways of doing it. It doesn't always have to be done throughout the process. Um, but uh, I think that's a really critical thing, investigating phenomena that are of interest to organizations, because if you're not investigating something that's of interest to them, you won't get the access. And without the access, you can't get the data. So the key message now is access. And again, that also touches on impact, isn't it? Um, do research that has impact, um, impact to the organization, not just looking at it from a scholarly academic perspective, I guess. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, and obviously being in the UK, when one mentions impact, one thinks about really big, large scale impact. But yes, um, I think once you're inside an organization, organizations will often discover that having a researcher there is incredibly useful, um, but, they, but they don't know that until you're there. So you have to convince them that they should give you access and give you the support and that what you're doing could be useful to them as well as, as, well as it's useful to you. And of course there's tricks in negotiating the access because you have to make sure that you're collecting the data you need for your research, which might be more than they need to have shared with them for uh, the purposes of being there. Um, so negotiating access is always a tricky point, but I think it's very difficult to do high quality strategies, practice research without having good quality access. Yeah, especially for early career academics. So that's, that's one of the things I wanted to, um, I'd like to end with. So I know that you, this paper is one of the early, your early works after your PhD. And I'm thinking, and you had such amazing access, you had, you had good, you, you had good stuff that you could reflect on that got you to write this piece and say, well, this is something that needs to be done. How, how would, how do early, how do you think that early career researchers can actually kind of navigate that access? Do you have any, just one tip if you wanted to? Well, I think the best way to navigate access is to quite frankly be working with a more senior scholar who can convince someone that you should be in the organisation. I mean, look, I did have an advantage because I'd worked as a consultant. So it was easier for me to, um, I guess, negotiate once I was inside organisations. But being inside organisations can require political skills. It can be quite high risk. Um, but without the support of my PhD supervisor, um, who helped convince an organization to give me access, it would have been much harder to get the access. So I think you do need to be supported by your PhD supervisor and other senior scholars. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing this amazing insight to us here today, Julia. So um, for those of you who are listening, in the next vlog, I'll be talking with Rebecca Bednarek, who'll be sharing with us about how to conduct innovative field work. So stay tuned to that one. Thanks again.